Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And thanks particularly to Yusuf and the team from uh, the Institute for asking me to participate in this. By the way, I'm not a consultant. I, I'm a full-time researcher at the Mandela Institute at University of Fort Hare, and I don't know where, I often hear this being said, but it's not true at all. Um, I think this is such an important issue that uh, uh, having discussions like this are absolutely critical, and that's the reason why, although I'm not an expert in this area, I've not, uh, I know the literature, some of it, but there are people who are far more uh, capable in this area, uh, I agreed to participate because I think I have some ideas to share, which I hope will provoke stronger discussion on this issue, and I'm perfectly happy to uh, field criticisms of my perspective, which I think will become clear as I go along. I want to begin with two quotations. The first is taken from an interview with Mr. Warren Buffett, conducted by uh, uh, ben Stein for the New York Times. Stein went to visit Buffett and was asking him about, uh, because Buffett actually had a list of uh, his staff and the tax, the ratio of tax they pay relative to incomes. And on that was pretty clear, and, and Buffett uh, ad admitted it immediately, uh, that proportionate to his income, his staff ordinary staff, clerks, you know, cleaners, uh, telephonists, etc., etc., paid a considerably greater amount of tax than he, he does. And uh, he, of course, said, well, you know, he, he understands exactly that. And when Ben Stein said to him, Ben Stein said to him, well, aren't you, whenever I raise this question, by the way, Ben Stein is a conservative, he says in his article, He's a political conservative. But I, when I raise this question with people uh, like yourself, uh, I'm accused of stirring class war. Well, Buffett says to him, this was Buffett's response, there's class war all right, but it's my class, the rich class that's making war, and we're winning. The other quote, is taken from the other great billionaire of our times, philanthropist, none other than Gates, uh, writing in his book, Creative Capitalism. And he argues that the genius of capitalism lies in its ability to make self-interest serve the wider interest, but to harness this power so it benefits everyone. We need to refine the system. We need to develop an approach where governments, business, and nonprofits work together to stretch the reach of market forces so that more people can make a profit or gain recognition. And he says, doing work that eases the world's inequities. As you can see, these are in intensely ideological statements. Uh, and in fact, they represent what exactly is the major global debate today. My own approach, by the way, is also intensely ideological because it sets out to propose a set of ideas, ideals, values, assumptions, propositions, based on a set of interests, which I think we need to have on the table in order to have an honest and frank debate about these things. So you can see that the perspectives <clears throat> on this issue are not just incidental. They are fundamental to the nature of the global system which we live in and which we hope to promote and which we aspire to. And so I don't intend
to be quite honest, I don't intend looking uh, more closely at the issues that Yusuf raised. I have an interest in all of that, but I don't think today is the day for me to talk about the opportunism of uh, uh, those who want to enter into the public schooling system and uh, uh, public services, the public good in general. I don't want to talk about the qualitative and quantitative issues. Uh, the literature is, is absolutely clear on it that it's ambiguous. And by the way, uh, even the literature, the essential point about it is that if you evaluate schooling systems contextually, then you will begin to understand why particular schools do better than others. It's not a no great miracle to understand that, you know. <clears throat> so I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about uh, what Keith Lewin raises in a number of, uh, number of questions about the nature of these partnerships. I'm not going to talk about what, um, there's this wonderful book by Diane uh, Ravage, which uh, talks about the hoax of the privatization movement. Uh, you can all read that. I'm not going to talk about the standardization of tests. I'm not going to talk about the attack on teachers' uh, uh, rights. I'm not going to talk about the um, reduction <laughs> of salaries. I have no interest. You, you can talk about all that. And as my friend Salim Vali has written, I'm not going to talk about rates of profitability and, of course, you know, executive pay and so on and so forth. None of, because, because I want to speak about the provenance of this global movement for privatization, not only for schools, but in general. So the important issue for us to understand these debates, the background to these debates, is the origin of the ideas of privatization. And you have to have a long view of history to understand these things, because what is happening now uh, at the behest of global corporate capitalism is a sea change in the very nature of capitalism, is in fact we are being taken into a completely different epoch. Uh, but in the history of capitalism, its contradictory nature, the crises, and the destruction of the planet. That's where we are going with this. So I'm not going to talk about whether there are different kinds of, forgive me, Yusuf, of different kinds of private schools, whether there is a balance between this and that and the other type. And, where, you know, and I am talking about you know, when I wrote an article in the Mail and Guardian two or three years ago, I, I got a letter from a church school saying, by the way, you know, you're talking about all of us as though we're all the same. No, 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 no. I myself come from a grant school, you know, in a little town I grew up. Uh, people put money together uh, because apartheid didn't support those schools. So I'm, I know that, but they didn't do it for profit. They certainly didn't do it for that. They did it because of their genuine concern about the building of communities. So the provenance, the origins of the movement for privatization arises, and you have to think about this carefully, in two particular phenomena, I think, over the last century. It's about, you know, you have to look at this view from a long view of history. Uh, in the first instance, it has to do with the repeated, continuous, convulsions and crisis in the development of modern capitalism. Because in the interwar years, capitalism was in danger of revolutionary upheavals, you know? If you read the history of this period, and I'm not just talking of the Russian Revolution, the Biano Rosso in Italy, the Rata in Germany, the Clyde movement in the UK, real revolutionary movements which threatened to place workers at the charge of societies. This is what capital was terrified about. And in fact, it is this which led Hitler to smash the workers' organizations and then to murder millions of Jews and other people. But the first concentration camps were built for socialists, and that's where they were put. So it was this particular fear 
this, that, in fact, there are possibilities of revolutionary movements which will destroy capitalism that begins to make the idea of how do we change and yet not change, you know, uh, into the menu of future policy. The, the other thing was, of course, the boom and bust cycles which capitalism, which characterized capitalism throughout its history, throughout its 20th century history. Continuous instability, you know, one day is high rates of inflation, next day it's uh, stagflation, the third day is, you know, uh, some other. And although Keynes uh, attempted to uh, uh, teach governments about the importance of, of interventionist state policies, pump priming to, in, uh, to, to, to uh, get greater circulation of capital and so on and so forth, uh, capitalism, because of its inherently contradictory nature, uh, something which was explained, you know, 150 years ago. I see the book uh, Marx's Capital is suddenly becoming the most, be the best read book. Uh, it certainly is the best read book in Germany, despite, you know, the, the, those Fukuyama and others saying the history has, history has come to an end. But, uh, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not repeating all of that. I'm merely saying that the idea that there are such severe and fundamental contradictions in this system of production, that idea uh, it doesn't need more proof. It is there in the corpses of the millions of people who suffer the consequences. And then, of course, in modern capitalist economies, class conflict continues despite the social democracies in the post-war period. And anti-colonial struggles begin to uh, uh, put some more pressure and begin to stamp their uh, feature on historical evolution, begin to say, we won't tolerate this any further. And these are the crises on the one hand, which lead ultimately to the crisis of the 1970s, which you have talked about. On the other hand, the second and very important development in the 20th century was <clears throat> the, de the decay uh, of the Stalinist command economies of the Soviet Russia, of Soviet Russia and its satellites. This decay was also almost inevitable given the utterly bureaucratic command planning systems under Goss plan, which would, by the way, uh, by the way, uh, I must tell you this, that I read an article by Bob Wolf saying that uh, the commandist, the Stalinist commandist who occupied that high rise building uh, for the Goss plan would be envious of the levels of concentration of decision making in the corporate world today. That in fact, what the corporate world, I mean, you know, you can imagine the size of the corporations I'm talking about. And who makes the central decisions? How many people make those decisions which affect the lives of millions of people? Uh, I think it's true that the gas planners might have been envious about the capacity of modern corporate capitalism, uh, added to the fact that it's got fantastic technological capability to make plans which affect the lives of millions and the environment. So, uh, uh, and of course, the other factors which utterly uh, uh, destroyed the Soviet state is dangerously autocratic-led party officials completely fixated by the power of the Central Committee. The, total destruction of the democratic institutions uh, created under the, under the leadership of workers, peasants, and soldiers in the Soviets. And the inability, of course, to compete with capitalist production systems, uh, which was exacerbated by the obsolescence of Soviet technologies. All of which exacerbated further by the Soviet Union's Is that true? Well, let me say then that what we have is the building of an ideological edifice over the last 40 or 50 years. People have called it neoliberalism. That's what is the basis, the genesis of what we have today parading or stamping its authority as the privatization 
of public resources and private corporations salivating at the idea of 71 trillion rands to be invested in the next 10 or 15 years out of the public purse for which ordinary citizens will continue to be liable for generations to come because that money will come from taxpayers. And the, effect, <clears throat> and the effect of this privatization, I'll run through them quickly because, it, you know, I mean, people write about this. They are, they are now, if I had to collect the books I, I've looked at, it would reach the ceiling. They talk about it as trade liberalization, managerialism, new forms of governance. The real effect of these things are, are that it has reduced the sovereignty of democratic states to whimpering servants. That's what's happened to the states. It's grabbed hold of states, demo, so-called democratic states, and has made them into really tools for, uh, for the use of private greed and power. It has created a, an environment, global environment of war, war on humanity, destruction of nations, three or four or five in the last 10 years. It has begun to ravage the natural environment. It has created a kind of determinist logic. Everything must go according to growth rates, GDP. We are now in the era, you know, Karl Marx would be turning in his grave. He was accused of being a Marxist, which meant that he was an economic determinist. Come and read the stuff that's going on now, Mr. Marx, and you will see that you're a pale shadow of what's really going on. And the other thing is that uh, all of this ultimately is the attack on democracy, is the attack on the right of you and me to make decisions. It is the attack on the right of you and me to call for accountable government. It is an attack on our right as citizens. It is an attack on our fundamental human ability to act as creative citizens in a collective way. Uh, a civilization which homo sapiens, us, our, uh, uh, our genus has created over 160,000 years at least, if you were to go to the pinnacle point, possibly 200,000 years is at the edge of its life if this marauding barbaric system continues to have its way. So I'm no scholar, and I'm not dispassionate and in my scholarship. I don't pretend to be any of that. I look at social reality, because in the places where I work, amongst the most marginal constituencies of our society, this is the reality. It's not the reality that we see, most of us, even me, in our middle class life, we have none of that. And it's about time we as academics and people with a social conscience act as the activists, the intellectual and practical activists that we are meant to be, because that's what we are being paid for. Thank you very much.